Fire consumes what it touches. It is merciless in its destructive nature. It does not discriminate friend from foe, and it will gladly devastate anything that gets in its way, growing stronger as it builds. But there are a few who know how to tame the flame. These few warriors who dare to reach out and subdue and control the inferno must be as merciless as the fire they wield, but disciplined beyond comparison, for only the controlled and disciplined hand can handle the wild flame. This is the gift and the curse of the Tan Hu of For Honor, the fiery masters of artillery who fight alongside the Wu Lin. But who are the Tan Hu in history? What are they based on? Are they really fire-bending warriors in China's history? Let's talk about it. Welcome back to Heroes in History, where we take a look at all of For Honor's heroes and discuss who they are most likely based on and whether or not they do their counterparts justice. Today, we are examining Tan Hu, and this is a warrior that I've wanted to cover for some time. Now, firstly, we need to examine who the Tan Hu were in lore. Tan Hu, the word, can mean cutting tiger or slaying tiger. The lore explains that back during the high period of the Wu Lin's homeland, the Tan Hu were the emperor's protectors, servants, and loyal soldiers. They were elite warriors tasked with the defense of the emperor's will and interest. But now, with the Wu Lin homeland in devastation and the current war being waged in Heathmore, the purpose of the Tan Hu has changed considerably. Now they are artillery specialists, wielding long swords called Changdao and rushing onto the battlefield with a fury that matches their fiery dispositions and weaponry. Some of the Tan Hu have burns or scarring on their faces and bodies that indicates they are sometimes subject to the backlash of their own experiment with fire and possibly even alchemy. There is even speculation that the Tan Hu are alchemists for the Emperor, and it was through their research that Astria stole that the Order of Horkos was able to unlock the corrupting powers of Draconite. This was hinted at during the Tan Hu's event game mode, Tan Hu's Gambit, where remnants of the Blackstone Legion led an assault on the Wu Lin stronghold, where Sun Da was performing a desperate experiment that went wrong. Tan Hu and others fled with the Emperor away from the fortress for the Emperor's own safety, and it is speculated that after they escaped, the Blackstone stole the results and research materials of the Tan Hu, which led to Astria creating her Draconite corrupted weapons and armor, though this is just speculatory. So with all that said, is there any connection to history here? Who are the Tsan Hu? With all this fantasy about them, surely they have little in common with the real world, right? Well, actually, they do have a historical counterpart. The Tsan Hu are primarily based off of the Jin Yi Wei, the Ming Dynasty's elite guard and secret police. Founded as early as 1360, the Jin Yi Wei were the bodyguards of Su Yan Zhan, the man who would go on to found the Ming Dynasty. Literally meaning brocade-clad guard, the Jin Yi Wei were known for their uniform code with a tablet worn on the front, not unlike a police badge or shield to indicate their status. After Su Tian Zhang conquered China and became the first Ming Emperor, he doubted his subjects' loyalties. Chinese imperial history is a long and bloody one, where turncoats, grabs for power, and sudden assassinations were not only common, but anticipated. Fearing this, the new Hongwu Emperor of Ming China changed the purpose of the Jin Yi Wei. Not only were they bodyguards, they became spies, tasked with spying on the citizens of China and weeding out any signs of treason or treachery. Later on, that task extended further so the Jin Yi Wei could now spy on and report on the officials of the imperial court. In 1382, now 500 members in strength, the Jin Yi Wei were officially ratified as the Special Inquisitorial Secret Police of China. Three years later, their numbers would grow to almost 14,000. Their role was frighteningly simple and brutal. Consider them the equivalent of the Inquisition from Warhammer 40k, or even for Europe's own bloody history. The Jin Yi Wei had supreme judicial authority. They had the freedom to arrest without warrant or reason, interrogate prisoners without authorization from any higher officer, to hold prisoners indefinitely without trial or visitation, and to sentence citizens whether they were tried and convicted or not. The Jin Yi Wei had complete authority, answering only to the Emperor of China himself. Beyond being the shadowy secret police of China, they were also military tacticians and information gatherers and commissars of the Chinese military. In times of military duty, Jin Yi Wei might be deployed with the army. They would oversee the training, discipline, and demeanor of the soldiers and weed out the weaker ones who would be a weakness to the overall strength of the army, as well as to ensure there were not chances of treachery or mutiny among the soldiers. 
They were also there to inspect the generals and leading officers to ensure that they were going to follow their orders, sometimes even giving the orders to them. As the Jinyue were at the beck and call of the emperor himself, their word was quite often the emperor's will. More than this, the Jinyue also were tactically and martially trained. When information was delivered to the military officers on enemy movements or strategies, Jin Yi Wei were sometimes able to reorganize the army's moves and provide tactical feedback. However, they weren't just intelligent. They were trained in special martial arts and armed with unique swords, most likely some form of Dao sword, not the Chang Dao scene in the game, which we'll talk about a bit later. But the Jin Yue were given special training and instruction in hand-to-hand -hand combat and in swordsmanship so as to always be prepared to execute enemies of the state whenever and however they deem necessary. In most cases, the less the Emperor knew about their methods, the better off he was. That's why he trusted them, of course. However, the power the Jin Yue wielded was not always so cut and dry. Most famously was the Lan Yu case in 1393. A Ming general named Lan Yu, who had been very capable and skilled during the wars against the Northern Yuan Dynasty, favored Xu Biao to be the next crown prince of the empire, and feared that the other crown princes, Zhu Di and Xu Yuanwen, would become trouble for him. The Hongwu Emperor feared that if the general was becoming too involved in political matters, if one of the other two sons were named Crown Prince instead, he might intervene and plan a revolt. So, Lan Yu had to be removed. In 1393, a Jin Yue officer named Jiang Huan accused Lan Yu of planning treason and conducted a search of his residence. 10,000 Japanese swords were found there, implying a secret alliance with the Japanese. Lan Yu was immediately sentenced to death, and his clan was completely destroyed by order of the Jin Yi Wei. That would have been fine on its own, but the Jin Yi Wei went further than even that. Lan Yu was a very popular figure, and many attempted to defend him or argue against the accusation. These people were considered collaborators by the Jin Yi Wei and were executed. By the end of the incident, 15,000 citizens were implicated and or executed for treason, 12 of them being Marquis and at least two counts. It was clear to the Hongwu Emperor that he had gone a bit too far, so he reduced the power of the Jin Yi Wei as a result. Ironically, though, this attempt to remove a potential threat to Xu Yunwen, the new crown prince, was a foolish one. As with Lan Yu's death, there were no capable generals in place to prevent Xu Di from usurping the throne after his brother's death and becoming the Yonggu Emperor. When Xu Di became emperor, he immediately returned the Jin Yiwei back to full power and authority, as he knew his rising to the throne was not popular, and he needed to be sure no one threatened his power. Oh, and speaking of Xu Di, does that name sound a little familiar? I'm Xu Di. Welcome to Ba Sing Se. I'm Xu Di. Welcome to Ba Sing Se. Yes, the Ju Di in Avatar The Last Airbender might have been inspired by the name of the new Yongol Emperor who rose to power as a result of the Jin Yue's influence and position. In fact, some historians speculate that the Jin Yue orchestrated Ju Di's rise to power specifically to put themselves back in a position of authority, which fits very well with their covert inquisition-like nature. Oh, and while we're on the subject of Avatar The Last Airbender, many of you may already have noticed the similarities between the San Hu of For Honor and the Dai Li of Ba Sing Se. And who are the mean-looking guys in robes? Those men are agents of the Dai Li, the cultural authority of Ba Sing Se. <laughs> What's going on here? You're under house arrest. A group of secret police earthbenders who specialized training and authority used Gestapo-like methods and mind-breaking tactics to preserve order in the city. And you wouldn't be wrong either. The Dai Li were also inspired by the Jin Yi Wei. But if the Zan Hu embody the military aspect of the Jin Yi Wei, the Dai Li embody the cold, calculating, and efficient covert agency aspect, silencing dissidents and removing high-ranking figures who pose a threat to the will of the ruling body. The Jin Yi Wei would maintain their position in Ming Dynasty China for the rest of its existence, finally being disbanded 262 years with, later with the rise of the Shun Dynasty in 1644. 
But now that we've discussed who they were in history, can we say that Tsan Hu are similar? In many ways, yes. While the Tsan Hu were clearly more warriors than secret police, their uniform is very similar to the uniform of the Jin Yi Wei, and they specialize in a specific sword. Though it's a Chang Dao and not the same as what a Jin Yi Wei carried, the principle is similar. The Chang Dao, since we're on that subject, was first used during the Tang Dynasty, but was readopted and modified during the Ming Dynasty by a Chinese general named Qi Xiang Guang, who came across schematics for the Japanese Odachi and wanted to create a similar weapon for his troops. So people who say that San Hu is just a Chinese can say, you're not entirely wrong, as his weapon was meant to be similar to the Nodachi. However, there are discrepancies. The actual Changdao in history's handle was supposedly a bit longer than what the San Hu carries, and it should bear more resemblance to a long Nagamaki or Odachi rather than a Nodachi. And with that said, Qi Jiang Gong found the weapon so useful, he commissioned it to 40% of his overall troops, making it a highly popular weapon. So even if you want to argue that he's just a ripoff of Kensei, it was a very popular weapon in Ming Dynasty China. So it does have historical precedence. Now, the fire controlling powers of the Tsan Hu is largely fictional, I'm afraid. There's no historical record of the Jin Yue using fire based attacks or explosives. However, the Chinese military, particularly during the Ming Dynasty, did develop a proficiency with explosives and artillery, so it's possible that the source for that addition is from that use of explosives and artillery. But I really don't mind it. I think the addition is creative. In fact, the Tsan Hu as a whole is incredibly fascinating to me. With his ability to use fire and a long-reaching sword to control the battlefield, San Hu can potentially turn the tide with his presence alone, and that is something incredibly unique that I enjoy about his character. Discipline and duty are absolute. To achieve excellence on the battlefield requires merciless conviction and courage, and the self-control to fan and tame the flames of war. Few can harness it, and fewer will survive it. But those with the discipline, courage, and fortitude to command the fires of war will rise above all opposition and change the course of history. They will weed out the weak, the cowardly, and the treacherous, and they will burn the fires of honor and conviction. This is the flame of Tsan Hu, the masters of the fires of war. Thank you for watching this episode of Heroes in History, and I will see you in my next one. Take care. Oh no! a lot of damage!
You think you can get rid of me that easily, Goblin? In your last moments, you look for an escape. Any solace you can find, but it's just you and me, Tiny! Sign me up for the next war.